listen to that red army tank purr. Kia ora everyone and welcome back to this Humankind. Today we're going to discuss these reasons why Humankind is arguably better than Civilization, particularly Civilization 6. Acknowledging of course that both games are different, they have unique strengths, and they're on different development and release journeys. Without any further ado though, let's jump in and talk everything from trade, barbarians, to districts, and more. For starters, I want to cover humankind's neutral tribes, these that you can see here on screen. These are essentially humankind's barbarians, but they behave very differently and arguably much better. You can see here that when they develop a city within a territory, they have an ideology, just like you do. In this case, they are much more traditional than I am. I'm progressive. But all in all, that helps to shape your relationship with them. Will you take them over and take their city, or, like I'm doing here, build influence through bribing them with gold or praising them with influence? Eventually, you can assimilate them into your empire, and depending on how similar they are to you, that will impact on your stability, i.e. your empire's overall happiness. You can also trade with them while they're an independent, uh, a sort of an independent city, which is another benefit, right? They, they're also a trade partner. Uh, this one is peaceful, but there are others who will be much more hungry for war and they will attack you first. So do take care. Each of these tribes have their own unique ideology, their own unique units, which by the way, you can actually rent. As you can see here, for a very small amount of gold, you can rent armies that are not otherwise already defending a city. I can't rent these ones because they're in defense mode, but that's broadly how humankind's sort of uh, overall system of barbarians is really a much more nuanced and developed one than Civilization VI's. Next up here, I think it's pretty important that we discuss that all-important trade. Have a look at this trade overview. Here I am, the French, trading with the Siamese. You can see they have a lot of resources on offer, and I must say this is a much much easier and more rewarding system than what Civilization VI offers. You can open up any diplomatic menu, open up treaties to either open your trade more or restrict it completely. Trade in humankind happens in the background, in line with your treaties. If you have closed trade, then nothing will happen. If you have open trade with luxuries, or indeed with everything, you'll then be able to passively trade off the things that you have to other empires without having to accept or decline because your treaties have set your policy direction. It's also important to note that in humankind, if you have a resource, you can also trade that resource. This seems... Actually, strikingly logical, if you think about it in real life, if a country has access to something, let's say dairy or gemstones, gold, whatever it may be, they're probably going to keep a little bit at least for themselves. And I think that's what humankind does well. It says you can harvest this gold, but also you can trade some of it as well. Here you can see it's a really easy list to just go through, choose the resources I want and buy them. I can also click them on the map itself. So if you're not interested in delving into this trade, treaties and diplomacy screen, you can literally just click the little resource icon around the map, regardless of who's owning it, and buy it if you have the appropriate trade treaties in place. Next up, I think we need to talk cities, infrastructure, festivals, wonders and projects. In Humankind, you can see here some much later game footage. The cities and territory system is very nuanced and arguably better than Civilization VI's. You can see on the right hand side of your screen there are really four key functions within my city, arguably five actually. You have units which you can build, that one's straightforward, although it's important to note that in humankind units do take population from a city and if you disband them you can add population back in. A nice way to make population a metric. You can see that some units as well, like this settler unit, have really specific nuanced functions. You can make this in the later game to establish much better cities without having to rely on unlocking a certain cultural policy and serve and then attaching it into your government and blah blah blah. You can actually just build settlers. But more than that, cities have these districts which you place on the map. You can see here E-Tasmania has a lot of districts around it at this very late stage in the game which you would expect from modern civilization. You can also build infrastructure and festivals or ceremonies that are one-off improvements to your cities and help to strengthen your districts. Districts themselves, of course, have adjacency bonuses which we're used to in Civ, but the crucial thing here is unless they're emblematic districts, you can actually build more than one 
And thank goodness you can replace them. Why, oh why, Civilization VI, do you not allow me to replace my districts? Humankind does. And these shared projects, you can see here I'm looking around for somewhere to place my Mars colony. These shared projects help to share between cities. These massive projects like researching nukes or sending a satellite to space can indeed borrow production and resources from other cities. You can work on them across the empire. And I think that makes a lot of sense if you consider just how motivated an entire nation might be to put resources towards something like that. Next up here in Humankind, I want to talk about oceans, and specifically ocean and sea tiles. Humankind has around four or five different ones which help make its ocean more interesting. Now, I do have to acknowledge the downside here, like many other 4X games and like Civ, is that unfortunately Humankind does not really embrace the ocean as much as I would like. However, take a look at this. There are a few different types of coastal tile, there are a few different types of deep ocean tile. The deep ocean tiles will cause units, particularly in the early game, to suffer from attrition. A nice bonus, and that is a really fun realistic flavour as well, I think. Uh, for example, a settler out in the middle of the open ocean in what Humankind could offer as a foggy tile, or a rough sea tile will take damage just as they would have in real life during this period. But also take a look at these juicy tiles off the coast of Australia. Reefs provide science, of course improvements to luxuries and others can provide gold and influence and many more things. Overall, humankind's oceans are actually quite interesting and engaging and if they build on it a bit more, they can do really well. We'll cover humankind's combat systems a bit later, but I have to say that naval combat is just as fun and engaging as land combat too. Let's build on that more, humankind. Next up here, after we've discussed the oceans, I think we need to discuss humankind's society menu, screens, overlays, the whole shebang, because it's very interesting. Civilization players would likely akin society to culture. This is sort of civilization's culture mechanic, but much better. Here you can see the society screen and how my social pressure, which is largely brought about by how much influence I'm producing, this is sort of the resource equivalent to civilization's culture resource, if you want to think about it like that, how my influence is spreading across the globe. You can see that my influence is stretching across territories even that I don't own. Each one is providing me with even more influence. If you have a look here, this is where the clash of civilization organizations comes in though. Look at these territories that are vying for influence. Do I have trade routes going to them? Do I have open borders or closed? How similar are our societies and our ideologies? All of these things, plus your influence generation, that key resource, will help to shape how your society spreads. And the further it spreads, the more pressure it can put on others, forcing their stability to drop, forcing them to take on your civics and policies, and more quite detrimental effects if they choose to fight back against them, or they could choose to embrace them and be absorbed into your sphere of influence. Here is another thing that you can spend your influence on, it's civics. These are essentially civilization's culture tree. Here you can see I'm making decisions between mercenary armies and assimilated peoples. How do I want to treat those barbarian tribes that we talked about in the beginning? Each civic will offer a different branch along my civics tree, shaping my societal values, but also giving me in-game bonuses and benefits that I can use across the board. You can see the tree has seven different branches for each sort of section of society, military, religion, so on and so forth, and they have some very interesting and powerful effects that can really help shape the entire structure of your game. Moreover, I like the fact that this screen, the Society Sphere of Influence screen, is also applied to religion in humankind. Another great little thing that they were able to use to sort of stretch these two systems into two distinct things, but also two very different ones. You can also see here on the Society screen, I can hover over different uh, wonders, different uh, natural resources, uh, dare I say actually natural wonders, and all together you can see how everything is flowing across in this beautiful web of influence, society, and civics. It's a wonderful system. And add on these in-game events which also shape the structure of your society, and you've got a really well-rounded and fun system. Speaking of fun systems, I think we should now acknowledge combat. You're going to see two different battles here, and I have to admit, I cherry-picked them because they were ones where I just had the best experience ever. Not because it was a close battle, arguably those are more fun, but because I absolutely dominated my opponent. 
Look at the range that different units offer. These siege units can be used outside of battle as well to bombard enemy territories. Another fun function that takes humankind's units and gives them more use outside of simple combat. But here you can see me manually resolving battles. Each unit has its own tile, yet when you're navigating the world outside of these battles, you can move your units around in groups. It's a wonderful way to separate combat from unit movement, the addition of having reinforceable units into battles adds another layer of strategy as well. And finally, overall, Humankind's combat system helps to make itself more interesting and engaging thanks to the fact that when you engage a battle, it creates this sort of sub-zone. You can see here I'm zoomed in on these units, and the rest of the world outside of those solid white boundaries is actually considered not part of the battle. So what does humankind do as we transition into another whomper of a battle here where I bring my helicopters in for some fun? Well, it creates this zone. Here is actually a better demonstration because the battlefield itself has been greyed out. You can see the greyed out boundaries of the battlefield and then the rest of the world continues outside of it. Humankind says these battles matter and if you want to manually resolve them, you don't have to by the way, you can choose to auto resolve at any point, either before or during the fight, but if you choose to manually resolve it, Humankind says, okay, here's the area for battle. We're going to give you three rounds each to fight or defend. Remembering that geography plays a role here. High ground matters. Crossing rivers matters. Where are forts built? Horses can't climb them, so you better make sure that you use geography to your favour in what is definitely an incredibly engaging system, as I say, over three rounds, and then you have to end your turn and start a new turn where you can do another three rounds of warfare. It helps to truncate warfare so that it doesn't just stretch out infinitely. It doesn't turn into a who clicks first battle as well. In multiplayer, there are some issues to work around, I acknowledge, but for most single player uh, experiences, you're gonna really, really enjoy this combat system. Next up, actually, and we have to now take a step back to some of the fundamental things that help make humankind a great experience. Here is the avatar creation screen. Uh, here's mine, by the way, which, funnily enough, you can actually download on the Games Together website and play against me in your game. I think at the moment there's over 55,000 avatars that people have created community influencers, game developers, and normal, everyday players for the most part. You can add different strengths, biases, and archetypes to your character and upload it for the world to experience. It's a really wonderful system and of course you can also customize the look of your character. This matters because your character, your persona, will be your sort of figurehead in humankind as you move through different cultures. This character will be your leader throughout the game, so it's kind of important that you decide who you want to be and how you want to experience the game. Not only can we share these with each other though, and indeed play with them a near infinite number of times, but you'll also note beyond this incredible character customization of, you know, facial details and blah blah blah, all of that really interesting stuff, you'll also note that more broadly when you're setting up a game like this, you can customize stuff even further. You can customize the personas who you're playing against, whether they're downloaded or default. You can change their color on the map, their symbol on the map. You can change everything, and all of that for yourself as well. It helps create an experience where you can sort of also tailor the strengths of your opponents a little bit without shifting the gameplay difficulty itself because you can have some personas who are expert whereas others have weaker abilities, they're beginners. Speaking of beginners, the beginning of the game is another feature that really separates humankind from civilization. So humankind is, is broadly uh, sort of segregated across six different eras within the game. But before then, at the very beginning, you have the Neolithic era. Here it's not about building cities, in fact you probably won't have any. At the most you might have some outposts where you've claimed some land, but it's unlikely you'll have many cities because this era is about expansion and exploration. Your tribal units can find discoveries, perhaps enemies to skirmish with without declaring war, and food. As nomadic units they will multiply and grow from more food and discoveries, eventually leading you through to the first proper era, the ancient era, where you can choose a culture. Which brings me to one of my final points for this video, in fact, the final point. It's about cultures and progressing eras and ultimately victory in humankind. 
When you're choosing a culture in this game, there are a few different things to choose from. Each culture has its own unique strengths, weaknesses, and other abilities. Some of them carry through the whole game like the cultural trait, whereas others are unique to that specific era. Every culture has its own emblematic uh, district and its own emblematic unit, at the very least. It helps really shape your gameplay, particularly as you move through the eras. Moreover, each culture also has its own affinity. Some are scientific, which leads them towards much more science. Others are agrarian, where you focus on food and population. There are seven in total, and you can change through eras throughout the game. You may choose an agrarian food-focused culture in the first era, but then notice that actually you want to fight someone. So choose a militaristic culture in the second for extra combat strength, and so on and so forth. This leads us through into earning era stars for all of those 70 affinities. Discovering a certain number of technologies, a certain number of military victories, gold earned, and so on, helps you to earn era stars. Once you earn seven of them, you can move through to the next in-game era, choose your culture, and repeat that wonderful formula throughout. Humankind offers us a fame-based victory system where essentially we are rewarded for deeds that we complete, era stars that we earn, overall achieving things first, and a myriad of other things that you earn fame for. This is kind of like your score, but it helps to really balance every kind of victory condition. And indeed, you can pursue multiple at once. You can earn a lot of fame, for example, for discovering the map and being the first to build certain things. At the same time, you can be earning fame for going to space, completing a space race discovering nuclear technologies. There are many ways to earn fame and build up points towards your victory, and that's what help makes humankind a very, very, very replayable experience. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me today in this Humankind and How It Beats Civilization VI video. If you did enjoy it, I would love a like rating. There's a lot of effort that goes into videos like this and a lot of researching on my behalf. And if you could reward me by smashing that like button to turn it, I believe, black now, not blue. Look how trendy we are. We are absolutely moving with the times and changing YouTube's colors. <laughs> anyway, everybody, until next time, I will see you then. Take care and bye-bye.